So yeah, I do apologise, being a bit bunged up over the weekend, a bit ill, so if I sound a bit funny. So today the talk's going to be somehow on quite classical things, but maybe with a different twist. And kind of we're going to try to bring a bit of a philosophical flavour to things. So when I say geometric stability of Valsor, this is not any real sort of theorem, but this is kind of just a consensus of things we want. So maybe in Vars law, we usually fix the domain and then want to we have a fixed domain, but here we want to now vary the domain. And we'll look at how this appears in asymptotic spectral shape optimization problems. So to begin, kind of our preliminaries are, we're going to consider bounded open convex sets. So throughout the talk, I mean, sometimes we won't, but just for now, pretend it is. So on this, we consider uh, the Dirichlet and Neumann Laplacians. So the Dirichlet Laplacian is just, well, the honest Laplacian, but now we sort of have a zero, we have a condition that the function is zero on the boundary. So in two dimensions, this is sort of a drum head and the eigenvalues which we get correspond physically to the pure modes of vibration of the drum head. And in the Neumann case, we want the inwards pointing normal derivative of the own function on the boundary is zero. So as uh, probably all of us know in this seminar, this under these conditions, we have a discrete spectrum of both Dirichlet, which will denote in blue here today, uh, eigenvalues, and of Neumann eigenvalues we'll put in red. Now, maybe non-standard to some people, I denote the first Neumann eigenvalue by mu1, so mu1 will always be zero in this talk, and that's because you can simply put the constant function in as an eigenfunction in the Neumann Laplacian case. Now here, we're going to also look at a big part of today will be the counting functions. So the counting functions, effectively, when we evaluate at alpha, we're just counting the number of eigenvalues, uh, both in the Dirichlet Laplacian case and the Neumann Laplacian case, strictly less than alpha. And the kind of idea is if we know the counting function perfectly, then we can, then we, we didn't, we'd know the eigenvalues perfectly. Um, but the kind of idea is if we can get some control on these counting functions, we can get some control on the eigenvalues. So this is the key idea. So kind of what's the main protagonist of today? The main protagonist is Vars law, which we should all be uh, hopefully familiar with. So Vars law asserts that the sort of the Neumann and Dirichlet eigenvalues asymptotically um, are sort of determined by the volume of the domain. So here you have four pi squared, k to the two over d, over, and then here, omega d is the volume of the uh, unit ball in d dimensions, and here, we denote the volume of the domain omega. So the volume determines this, and this led to inverse spectral problems, and things like this come on here, the shape of the drum, so you can hear uh, the volume of a drum head in determined dimension, um, but of course, in, in uh, there are isospectral drum heads. Um, this was mainly, I think, the plane due to Gordon, Webb, and Wolpert was the first example. And then, sort of, Val himself, after first proving sort of Val's law, uh, conjectured the uh, two term Val law. So then we start to see the difference between Dirichlet and Neumann eigenvalues. So, in the Dirichlet case, you get a second term where you add, basically, uh, you get a plus a second term where you have the perimeter. So for the perimeter in this talk, I think it's the D minus one dimensional Hausdorff measure of the boundary. And the key thing to really observe is if we constrained the volume in this case, then what we'd see is you actually want to sort of naively minimize Dirichlet eigenvalues because if you had sort of large perimeter, this would blow up. And in the Neumann case, we get the same second term, but now it comes to the minus side. In this case, you want to maximize Neumann eigenvalues under this constraint. So this two-term uh, VAR law is known to hold under some dynamical condition concerning periodic village trajectories and if omega is smooth. And this was done by Victor Avery in 1980. But this is the kind of setting we're in. So now I should really say what I mean by geometric stability of VAR's law, which is kind of we want basically the leading term to win. This is what we want. So the idea in a sort of a first instance is let omega k be a sequence of bounded domains. Now here we might, let's pretend we're not dealing with convex just for now. With a given volume V, then kind of the idea is under which geometric and topological constraints on the omega k do we have that if we look to the spectrum, they're asymptotically distributed according to the volume. 
So this may be a slightly strange thing to see, um, but it does actually appear quite a bit in shape optimization problems, things of this kind of ilk. So maybe as a sort of motivation, let's see some places where it appears, and then we'll sort of move into where we're looking at this asymptotic spectral shape optimization. So a first example, why not? Let's start something big, let's go crazy. So there's a Polyus conjecture. There was a paper by um, uh, Freitas, like I say, and Payet in 2021, building on the work of uh, Colbois and Al-Sufi, where they basically consider, you fix a, do a bounded domain, omega, say Lip well, Lipschitz in this case, say, and then set, you define a collection of domains as disjoint unions of scaled copies of the domain. And then you insert, you have this condition here to assert that they're all the same volume. So you take different copies of the domain, you have different scaled copies and you have a fixed volume. Now, basically they deduce that for each K and N, there exists a minimizer to this problem here. So you can find the minimizer minimizing over all of this, over this collection R omega, over all D and R omega, you can find a DK star for each K that attains this infimum here. Okay, now the key part of where you want to see this asymptotic behavior is, if you have the asymptotic behavior here that you design, if the limit of all the K value of the K minimizer, and you divide by K to the two over D, if you take the limit on this, if you get the VAL term here, then Polya's conjecture should hold for all domains in this collection R omega. So I should just remark quickly what Polya's conjecture and Dirac eigenbach is for this case. So it's that this leading VAL term is actually a lower bound. So this is kind of a first hint as to where these kind of behaviors appear. Now, of course, why is it hard to show this? So you can deduce, uh, as they did in their paper, that under a topological yeah, yeah, yeah. state now. Uh, Sam, can I ask a question? Oh, yes, please go ahead. Uh, uh, is, is the n fixed in this uh, definition of our omega, or n is can vary? Oh, sorry, n can vary. That's a good point. Sorry, I missed this. Yeah. So n is, yeah, n is not fixed. Uh, n is just, yeah, any natural, so any number of copies of any scale copies, as long as it's the same volume as omega. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so under the condition that you have at most little O of K connected components, then one actually has that this is true. Okay, so basically now you're seeing this sort of, I guess this stability of our law, which is if you don't have too many connected components, then one can in fact get the limit you desire. So in sense, it's an open problem. You know, if you can show that there is a minimizer, you can pick a minimizer of little OK connected components, then you're so then you're sort of done. But of course, this is, you know, this is still open problem. Okay, and then I should say that in the Neumann case, there's an analogous result, but now you have maximization. So now you basically replace everything and you just want to maximize the uh, Neumann eigenvalues. So let's play a bit sort of maybe fairer of where these things appear and what we can sort of say in other cases. So we really want the leading term to dominate. So we want the volume to really be the bit that we see and we want to sort of be there in the uh, limelight. So instead, if we look at perimeter constraint, we're kind of then dealing with isoparametric and isodiametric, we, sorry, dealing with the isoparametric inequality, which kind of then you want the ball has maximal volume. So kind of one feels that, you know, the ball should asymptotically minimize. So by what I mean by this is if we look at the problem of we want to minimize the uh, Kf Dirichlet eigenvalue, and now we can do it over sort of all, say, Lipschitz domains that are bound and open, may have many connected components, and the perimeter is less than one, then it's known that in this case, there is a minimizer, omega gay star, which is convex, because effectively you can in two dimensions, you can kind of bring the connected components close together and take the sort of convex hull, take the interior of this, and then by monotonicity of Dirichlet eigenvalues, everything works well. And then that was shown by uh, Michael Vandenberg and Meta Everson in 2013. And then later on in the same year, then uh, Bakura and Freitas uh, showed that the omega K star, these minimizers, any sequence of them must converge to the ball of unit perimeter as K goes to infinity. So the idea here of where this kind of 
Valo, the uh, sort of geometric stability of Valo came in, was that here you have, you can show that they're, um, the omega k star are non-degenerate in volume using sort of a Li Yao bound. Then you can deduce using Blaschke selection theorem and various bits from convex geometry that there must be a convergent subsequence. So you have some omega kj star converging to some omega infinity as j goes to infinity. Then I say idea in quotation marks here because this is not quite how it's done in the sense of you can actually cut a few lines off because you can use monotonicity and minimizers sort of in a special way. But the kind of key idea, if you wanted to add a few lines and try and get the sequence appearing, would be that you want to have that this is true. So if we go along the sequence of minimizers, uh, or this subsequence, then when we take the limit of evaluating sort of along this diagonal here, as j goes to infinity, then we arrive at four pi over the volume of the limit. Now, when we get to the limit, we know these are all minimizers. But if this convert, if this wasn't the ball, then this would have strictly less volume than the ball. And then the iso, and then the isoparametric sort of inequality then tells us, yeah, sorry, tells us that it has lower volume. And then this would contradict the optimality of the minimizers. So again, we're seeing this kind of stability of vars or appearing in these problems with perimeter constraints. Okay, so we'll discuss some more things when we maybe consider Neumann eigenvalues and stuff later on. Um, but for now, let's just focus on this uh, sort of stability of Vars law through three examples. So again, this is what we're aiming for. We've got lambda k omega k is asymptotically distributed like mu k omega k, which is just like the Vars term uh, of, with volume V when all of them have the same volume. Okay. So here's three bad examples, I should have really said. So example one, this is why in the um, in the Freitas, uh, Lagasse and Payette paper, you, you can't have sort of less than little Earth K connected components. Here's an example. So here, if you let omega K be the union of cables of radius um, K to the minus a half. So we're gonna do everything in the plane because I can't draw in higher dimensions. And I think, you know, the exact, the counter examples in higher dimensions of when this all fails is a very analogous. So here we have K balls. So each omega K um, has volume that has volume pi. Okay, because we're basically just chunking the unit ball into smaller ones. Now, in this case, when you have these disjoint unions and that all the domains are just isometric, we have K of them. So the Kth eigenvalue of this union, of this disjoint union of all the balls, so here, must just be lambda, um, I'll try to do it in blue. So lambda one of the ball of unit, uh, uh, unit radius, the unit ball, and then times K, because now we're just using the uh, quadratic scaling, the scaling under homotopy. Okay, now we know from Faber-Kran, you know, that this, well, not even Faber-Kran, we can evaluate specifically this already. Now this here, this term will be strictly bigger than four pi k over pi, which equals four k, because we know the first eigenvalue, first Dirac eigenvalue of the ball is strictly bigger than the ball term, right? It satisfies um, obvious conjecture, the strict obvious conjecture in that case. Now, in this case, when we look at those of the Neumann eigenvalues, you get zero. Because by the same argument, you get that the, the mu k of omega k must just be the first Neumann eigenvalue of the ball. And the first Neumann eigenvalue of the ball is just zero, as discussed earlier. So we can't have too many connected components. OK, so let's look at just connected domains. So now, omega k, say, we take as a rectangle. So and with side lengths here, so we might go 10k to the half and one over 10k to the half here to make it all uh, unit, unit volume. So here, if we look at lambda k omega k, then this is greater than or equal to lambda one of omega k, which is, if we know sort of our rectangles and you do separation of variables to determine the eigenvalues, this is equal to uh, 100 pi squared uh, k plus, Pi squared over 100k. Uh, yeah. 
So then in this case, I mean, you can see this is bigger than four pi k, which is what we want. So, you know, we've broken it again. And a similar case in the Neumann case, you have that you can bound above by pi squared uh, over 100 k, which of course, again, breaks the VAR law because this is now strictly less than four pi k because of the leading term. And then we don't get the generalization of VAR's law, we're sort of, uh, which we want. So, okay, so now we've got the diameter grows too much. This is bad. Too many connected components. This is bad. So I come to a final third example where we really go, this is bad. So now we just take simply connected. Um, and now we're taking it's bounded. And really, I should say, so I'm not going to go too much into details of how you compute this example, but the idea now is that we basically have K rectangles where we have height one and width one over K. Now, if we kind of, and then we connect K of these rectangles by thin tubes. Now a tube here sort of has sort of thin rectangles, I guess we call them as well. By here you have epsilon K and here you have one over K squared. Okay, so we connect them like this. And then the idea is that roughly approximately so if you shrink the epsilon k small enough, you could always kind of get close to it looking like disjoint unions via Sparrow's theorem or um, in the Dirichlet case. And in the Neumann case, you can do this just by trial functions. So the rough idea is that actually this is as to distributed a bit like uh, pi squared k squared in the Dirichlet case. And this you can make converge to zero in the Neumann case as k goes to infinity. So in this case as well, we really, you know, can't make it hold, well, which we want for our uh, for our sort of geometric stability of our slot. However, sort of, are we playing fair is the question. We're having a thing of, we can be as pathological as we want in this sort of case, we can always kind of break it. This is not sort of, you know, it's easy to break this idea. However, you kind of, we've seen now some obstructions, so too many connected components, perhaps the diameter's growing too fast, and the third example, if we come back, you could kind of think this is all collapsing in on itself in some way as K goes to infinity for this domain. So what we actually want is now you're crushing it. So then we have very degenerate boundary geometry. So this is bad as well. The sort of perimeter it really is just blowing up. So kind of how do we recover some things? So I kind of hope to explain this in sort of the case of the plane, and then I'll explain how you can do it in higher dimensions. But we'll sort of begin with rectangles. I mean, with rectangles, we know a lot. We know a lot of things. So like we can express the spectrum explicitly and you can sort of, uh, then the uh, argument counting function of Dirichlet and Neumann cases is like lattice counting problems for uh, ellipses. So, and then we'll look at where in convex domains we can sort of get a good control. And this is because the in convex domains there's a rich literature on convex geometry and you have good geometric control. And so life is good in the setting of complex. Okay. So first, the kind of game plan is we're going to prove a sort of simple proposition in the case of rectangles, and then we'll see what the actual challenges are when you just go to arbitrary convex domains. So if omega k is a sequence of rectangles of a given volume v, and then you let their perimeter go, grow like little o k, uh, little o of k to the half, then in fact, you get this VAR law you want, this geometric stability of VAR law. So for example, here in the, if you took omega k to be log k over k to the half here, and k to the half over log k here, then actually this would have hold. So in the other case, we took k to the half, k to the half with some um, fact coefficient of 10 out the front. But now if we sort of just put the log k in there, either side, then actually we recover it. So how does one sort of prove such a thing for rectangles? I mean, what's the sort of, sort of simple idea? Well, if you take omega to be a rectangle, then one can show, you know, that you have this lower bound on the counting function, the Neumann case. So then, okay, this is true for any rectangle. So now we do it for the sequence. So for the sequence, what we do is we know that K from the definition of the counting function, k is greater than or equal to the counting function evaluated the k-feigenvalue of omega k. 
Okay, and then we use the bound, which has omega k here and the volume and the perimeter of omega k here. Then we just sub in for where alpha was, we just sub in lambda k of omega k. Now with a bit of rearrangement, dividing through by k, a bit of rearrangement, you can deduce this condition here. Now, this is really a quadratic in square root of xk, and we want to look at when it's less than or equal to zero. So we're going to call this quadratic, depending on k, qk, and then we're going to evaluate at xk. Now I need to say what xk is. xk itself, oh, the zoom playing up, xk itself is lambda k, omega k divided by k. That's all xk is. So now we can look at the unique solution of qk of yk star equals zero. So there's a unique root of qk and this un sorry, unique positive root of qk. And then we know, because basically it looks like this, that xk itself must be less than or equal to yk star. Okay. So now the, the argument is, can we control yk star in su a suitably good way? Well, since the boundary grows, since the, sorry, the perimeter grows like little o of k to the half, then we can look here and we can go, well, this term for qk of k large becomes arbitrarily small. So really, it would start looking as if we just had this. So if I scribble out the middle, we just have this. So the unique solution should look like in the limit, well, whatever makes this term, whichever cancels out with this to make it one, so four pi over V. So in fact, this is true. If you argue it, there's the justification. So four pi over V, Y K star converges to as K goes to infinity. So in fact, lim sup of X K as K goes to infinity must be less than equal to lim sup of Y K star, which is four pi over V. And then, all right, for the lower bounds, we'll just use Polya's conjecture holding for rectangles, which is a due to Polya in 1960 fit in the Dirichlet case. And then, hence, we've we'll got the limit for the limb sup and a bit of sort of now we know this for XK, we get the asymptotic behavior we desired. And the Neumann case, you can do it completely analogous. So you take an upper bound for Neumann counting function and you can use Polya's conjecture as well. Okay, so we've seen this. So actually, it's quite sincere. Once you know the bounds, you can do this sort of trick with a quadratic, and life's good. So then the question is, what do we do in the case of just general planar convex domains? I mean, we can't, we don't know Polyus conjecture holds in uh, full generality. I mean, and so how do we get sufficiently good bounds of the counting function? We don't want remainders. We want just true bounds in the sense of we don't want a little O term we don't know anything about, we want explicit remainders. So this is now a challenge, right? We can't, we don't know the spectrum, so we don't have a way of representing it, it's just some eigenvalues and we know sort of some of the behavior we want. So now if we take omega k just to be a sequence of convex planar domains, which are, you know, bounded open, and their volume V, and then you let the perimeter only grow a little o k to the half, then lambda k of omega k is as to be the same as mu k omega k, which is like four pi k over v. So this is the stability again. So now I sort of hope to give a bit of a flavor of how one proves this. So again, we'll do it in the plane and then we'll discuss how you go to higher dimensions and what's the higher dimensional analog of this. And then of course, we'll move on to the shape of optimization. Now this little o k to the half, you really can't beat. So if we sort of think back to the two-term VAR conjecture, if you fix the volume on the second term, the, in the second term, the volume appears on the bottom. So if you fix this, then, so we'll try and go back all the way. Actually, I realize this is probably more helpful. So if we fix the volume on the bottom here, then really we need it in dimension two. This can't grow like k to the half. Really, if you take this, because... Otherwise, this would be like k to the half, and then you get k to the half times k to the half, but it'd be growing like k, and then you get it growing like k here. So then they start interfering with each other. So this is really, in many senses, the best you can hope for. And certainly you can make many examples where if you don't have little o k to the half, then it goes wrong. So k, okay, so everything works well in the case of planar complex domains. So how do we prove this? So we have Dirichlet Neumann bracketing. 
So mu k omega is less than lambda k omega. So the Neumann eigenvalue is the k Neumann eigenvalue is always less than or equal to the k Dirichlet eigenvalue. And so we only need to prove an upper bound for Neumann counting function and a lower bound for Dirichlet counting function. But again, we're sort of plagued in wanting some uniform control. So I will discuss how to prove an upper bound for the Neumann counting function. Okay, so the upper bounds, okay, is not really one single upper bound. It's a family of upper bounds where we're sort of trying to trade a price. So we're kind of trying to use, well, we'll discuss, we try and use sort of a uh, sort of cube counting trick, but we have to sort of add a bit of spice to it and sort of tweak it a bit to get what we desire. So here is, it's a bit strange because so what does the bound say? So we pick a natural number f. And then we have for all alpha bigger than zero, we have this upper bound of Neumann counting function of a planar convex domain by n over mu n plus one star. So what's mu n plus one star here? Mu n plus one star is the n plus one Neumann eigenvalue of the unit square. Okay, so the idea here is if I take the limit as n goes to infinity on this term, what will happen is I will get one over four pi, which is what I want in the asymptotic, really, to be my dream. However, in the second term, here, you end up with this CN. Now, the, the limitation of this technique, although elegant in some ways and sort of simple, you end up this CN sort of just blows up. And this is, you know, this is a problem. However, for what we're trying to do, as long as for each N we have a remaining term we can control, this is okay. So CN blows up. And then, of course, on the end, we just have 8 pi. So the nice sort of, I guess, fun corollary of this proof, which may be slightly strange, is that Polyer's conjecture must hold for the unit square in the Neumann case and also in the Dirichlet case by these tricks. Because if this was actually less, if you if it was broken, you could get something uh, strictly less than this, but then this would uh, invalidate it just against Bartle's law. But this is kind of coming from the idea of it being a tiling domain. So it's not really any new idea. It's just sort of a fun consequence of the bound. Okay, so it's a bit of a strange bound. So how do we prove it? So we just want to use a square counting argument. So we're trying to really use a classical technique to really try and eke this out, this behavior we want. So fix a delta bigger than zero. And then we consider this lattice delta z squared. So here I have an ellipse. And then I've got sort of delta z squared drawn on. So I have uh, these now squares, which are delta by delta. Now I sort of split into two cases to handle. Here you have an interior square, so I've shaded them with that in purple. Then you have boundary squares, which kind of lie on the boundary here. Now the interior squares are easy to handle in many ways. And when the boundary squares, we have a problem. So the idea is for these squares here, we know their spectrum. Well, we can sort of get a good control on the counting function. Now in the boundary, we want to intersect. We want to look at the intersection of this square and the domain. So this bit in here. Now, the problem with this is, I mean, we know really nothing about the spectrum that explicitly. We don't have monotonicity. There's a lot of things that sort of break. So how do we, so the challenge is going to be, how do we deal with the boundary squares? And this is kind of where the remainder comes a bit crazy. So let's talk about interior squares to begin with. So the case of interior squares is I'll call an interior square Q delta. So Q delta is just one of these squares lying inside of it. So kind of the big idea here is if we chop it up using these, this sort of lattice where we draw through it with Neumann eigenvalues by the variational characterization, if I sum up all the uh, counting functions of all these contributions, then this will be bigger than just the Neumann counting function of the original domain of the ellipse here. So then that's how we're going to bound from above. This, yeah, this just comes with the variational characterizations. So for the interior squares, this is where the trick becomes a bit stranger. So this is where the N starts to appear. So we're going to pick N as we want. So we pick an N, a natural number, and then we can look at the, at the Neumann counting function. Well, just by definition, again, if we look at the number of Neumann eigenvalues less than delta to the minus two times mu N plus one star, well, this must be less than with the N because this is just the N plus one eigenvalue of Q delta itself. 
just by the scaling of uh, bone eigenvalues under homotopy. Now, they can easily bound the number of such interior squares. So if we look here, I mean, they must lie inside the domain. So the natural bound is just delta to the minus two, then times the area of omega. So if we sum up the contribution from all these interior squares, we get an upper bound on it is n delta to the minus two times the area. Okay, so the interior squares are nice. They work well. Now for the boundary squares, uh, the trick is a bit, you know, we have to get a bit more uh, creative in some ways. So for boundary squares here in orange, we actually have, we want to exploit pain weinberger inequality. So the pain weinberger inequality says the following, that the first non-trivial Neumann eigenvalue, which I denote by mu2 here, is bounded below by pi squared over diameter, or say omega tilde here, where omega is a bounded open and convex domain. So that's what pain weinberger inequality says. So now the sort of problem is here is, and sort of off the bat, we, it doesn't actually give us good control if we just try and apply it here. Because the intersection of the domain, if this is a zoomed in part, the intersection of the domain here with the square itself must be convex. The intersection of just two convex domains is a convex domain. But then the yeah the problem then arises is if we just use pain weinberger here this isn't going to go so well so what we actually have to do is chop it up a bit more so instead so we fixed n we try and pick another natural number kappa n now depending on n such that we can just chop up into these smaller cubes in the boundary layer now once we chop up into these smaller cubes in the boundary layer we want to pick kappa n big enough so that one can, if you look at any of these squares or any of these intersections, you can get a good enough control on the diameter so that the first non-trivial eigenvalue of any of these bits must be at least as big as delta to the minus two mu n plus one star. That is at least that of the n, the n plus one non eigenvalue of this biggest square. So we chop it up. But it's the key point is we have to pick kappa n to be a natural number because we're basically now taking a super lattice somehow and we want it to be all compatible to all fit together in order to be able to use variational characterizations. Okay, so we have this chooses kappa n, and this means the following. So for these little boundary squares, we don't actually want to count these ones. So we basically now pretend they don't exist. If they don't intersect the domain, they don't exist in our book. And we'll sort of just loosely denote any of these little squares now that intersects our convex, original convex domain by this q cap to the n minus one delta. So for these small boundary squares from the pain weinberger inequality, you have you can bound the counting function of that with the intersection of a domain above by one. In fact, it's precisely one because zero is the first eigenvalue. Now, I don't particularly want to get too much into it, but why this exactly um, works when you bound is you want to try and count the number of these small, small ones down on the boundary, which intersect the domain. And this is why the richness of convex geometry comes to our aid, because we now have sort of, well, we have the complexity and we also have Steiner's theorem. So really, the idea is somehow we want to, if we draw our ellipse here, as we had before, we want to show that all these little cubes that intersect must lie in some neighborhood lying either side of the boundary here and here. And then we can basically just use the volume of this component and delta this kappa n squared uh, delta to the minus two times the volume of this component. And the volume of this, the interior bit you can bound by convexity and the outer bit you get by the Steiner formula. So don't worry too much about this, but the idea is you end up with this term here. So this is where you kind of get the remainder term after the VAR term that we wanted. So then... So then we want, so then if we add over all these small boundary squares of where they intersect with the domain and evaluate it delta to the minus two omega uh, mu n plus one star, then this is bounded above by this. Okay, with delta to the minus one, then plus eight pi. Now, when you just invoke the variational characterization as I've described before, we can actually bound the counting fun the Neumann counting function of the original domain omega above by, well, the sum over the interior squares, 
we discussed earlier, and then the sum over the small boundary squares where they intersect the domain. And then you get this bound here by just simply adding what we discussed on the last few slides. Then we set delta to be this, now delta itself kind of initially depends on M, but we fixed M, is mu M plus one star over alpha. And then when we sub in this, we get the result of the lemma. So this kind of gives, this then gives us a strange bound, which in the limit gives us the leading order term we want, but we pay the price on the, on the later terms. Now we have the lemma, we can basically just do the rectangle case again. So you basically just use a similar argument. We now just end up with a family of quadratics, each quadratic depending on n now. And you can basically show for each n, you have this bound here, uh, mu n plus one star over nv. And then you can basically, then you deduce the asymptotic behavior you want, because what happens is in the Dirichlet case, you get the limit is bigger than this for any such sequence. And then since n was arbitrary, we could just apply Vahl's law to this. And when you apply Vahl's law to this, you will just get four pi just coming from this because we, uh, this is just the n plus one uh, Neumann eigenvalue of the unit square. So now we have the limit of the Neumann eigenvalues. You can basically do analogous in the case of Dirichlet values to get a limb sub upper bound. Okay, so then you right, you want to form a lower bound on the Dirichlet counting function which I won't describe here, but it's actually easier than the Neumann one. You just basically want squares which lie inside the domain with the Dirichlet boundary condition. And you sort of use convexity to try and count these again. And then, so you can get this limb sup is bounded above by four pi over V. As you take N arbitrary again, we're exploiting Vahl's law here. So we get the same result. And then this proves the result. In fact, you can prove stronger results, which is, this limb sup here, sorry, this limb inf is valid, even if we drop this, if we have the assumption now, say that, uh, I don't know, even if we have the assumption that the volume of the omega k now is just less than or equal to v. So we can now drop it. So this is where shape optimizations come in. We can actually, for each side, for the limb inf and limb sup, you can sort of weaken the assumptions a bit. Okay. So in higher dimensions, what's the analog? In higher dimensions, you can play the same game. So for any natural number n and sort of a convex domain, you know, after the d bounded, convex open, non-empty, and alpha bigger than zero, you now get a remainder term. You now get an upper bound, which looks like this. we sort of, I'll call this remainder term here, which also depends on it. Now, Rn omega alpha is a degree d minus one polynomial and sort of alpha to the half whose coefficients are continuous with respect to the Hausdorff topology, and mu n plus one star, star now is the n plus one for Neumann eigenvalue of the unit Q in D dimensions. And you can also construct lower bounds for Dirichlet eigenvalue function in a similar way. So I just should say the difference here is we basically followed the same strategy again, Payne, Weinberg, everything. Why do we get this polynomial now in sort of degree D minus one? Well, this is coming from the Steiner theorem in higher dimensions. So we have quire mass integrals, and now we're trying to use good properties from quire mass integrals to do it. And in order to get good, and then this allows us now to gain control. So if you have a sequence of bounded open comets domains, a fixed volume, their diameter doesn't grow too fast. And indeed the volume dominates and we get the stability in Vahl's law. It's geometric stability. Okay, so I've talked for quite a bit on that. So, but hopefully kind of, the flavor of the sort of the ideas and the proofs has come in and you can sort of take them a bit further than maybe I've discussed. So let's talk for the final part on asymptotic spectral shape optimization and sort of where these can be used. So, okay, and maybe the spirit of my mathematical juvenility, let's just have a naive philosophy. And, you know, the naive philosophy is partially wrong, but I think it's a maybe a nice one to discuss. So if I look at the isodiametric and isoparametric inequalities, they tell me that the ball has maximal volume over all domains of a given diameter or per, uh, such perimeter, in the case of the isodiametric or isoparametric. So naively you go, well, Vahl's law, the first term is really dominated by the volume. So then the ball should somehow asymptotically minimize Dirichlet and uh, Neumann eigenvalues when you have domains of a given diameter or perimeter. Now, I know alarm bells may be going in some of your heads. I mean, this is not true, right? So we'll discuss why it's not true in a moment. But 
if we actually now, but we can recover some bits which were maybe a bit strange using these results. So just as a bit of notation going forwards, what I want to do is by this mathcal OD, I want to denote the collection of bounded convex open non-empty subsets of R to the D. Okay, so the first kind of, I guess, one to mention is a result by Michael Vandenberg in 2015. So in the case of Dirac eigenvalues, this sort of naive philosophy is actually true. So if you let G be either the perimeter or the diameter, then for each K being there, uh, greater than or equal to one, there is a minimizer, omega K star, which minimizes this. So it minimizes the k uh, Dirichlet eigenvalue over all convex domains where with G of omega less than or equal to one. And any sequence of minimizers in this case must Hausdorff converge to the ball B with G of B equals one as K goes to infinity. So this is actually quite similarly done in the spirit um, to that of uh, which we discussed earlier, Bacow and Freitas in the two-dimensional case. In fact, you can kind of lift that as a proof method onto this, but because I'm aware that this paper has a more sort of general strategy. Okay, so that's the Asatotti and Dirac case. So where does it go wrong for Neumann eigenvalues? Well, for D greater than or equal to three, the infimum of the kth Neumann eigenvalue over all convex domains with perimeter less than or equal to one is zero. Right, you can think about this, you take some collapsing, you sort of have some very long part, and then you take you take plenty of long parts, and then you can collapse one dimension because you basically make it, you could because of how the Neumann eigenvalues are defined or how they appear for the cuboid, you can basically crush one of the dimensions. So you can just it gives us that part doesn't give any contribution, and you can stretch out the other bits and then make the eigenvalue arbitrarily small. But because these are uh, you know, because of the rectangles, the first, the second Neumann eigenvalue must be non-trivial. So in this case, you can make it degenerate. So then you can't have possibly the existence of minimizers. However, in diameter constraint, which is kind of new now using some of these techniques, it's actually okay. So for each D bigger than two, or so any dimension, bigger than two, there exists some constant depending only on the dimension such that for all k bigger than this constant, there is the minimizer to this problem, which is the infimum of mu, uh, the infimum, so minimizing the kth Neumann eigenvalue over all uh, bounded convex domains with diameter less than or equal to one. And any sequence, or this should say, any sequence of minimizers, there we go, any sequence of minimizers, Hausdorff converges the ball of unit diameter as k goes to infinity. So this is kind of reflecting this geometric stability now. We're seeing that the, the leading term is dominating. So what we're expecting is actually true. So what this naive philosophy at the start, where you wanted the ball to asymptotically minimize the Neumann eigenvalues, is true in diameter constraint. But of course, I mean, yeah, so this is kind of very non-trivial from the first aspect of how you'd get these minimizers, but these are all coming really from the bounds that we create. And the asymptotic behavior is determined when you take the bounds for very large. Okay, so then, sort of maybe it's just me, I don't know, this is my philosophy on this. This, see here, I find sort of, I don't know, all right, it's obviously, I find it a bit frustrating in a way because somehow if we don't let the domains sort of, sort of grow in diameter too quickly, then you can sort of somehow control this and make it positive. So the idea is here where you just to go flat, you really want to stretch it to reach this influence. So if we don't let it stretch too much, then can we recover kind of this perimeter constraint argument? And the answer is yes. So perhaps here we have uh, Neumann, in the case of Neumann eigenvalues, we can kind of somewhat recover perimeter constraint. So here, if we take any dimension bigger than or equal to three, and we have a function from the natural numbers to the positive reals, such that asymptotically it's strictly bigger than one, but asymptotically it's also strictly less than k to the one over d, d minus one. Then there exists a constant depending only on the dimension and this function f that we picked such that for all k bigger than this constant, there exists a minimizer to this problem. So we look at the infimum of the kth Neumann eigenvalue 
over all convex domains of perimeter less than or equal to one and diameter less than or equal to f of k. Now this seems perhaps so sort of slightly strange because now the shape optimization problem each time we're increasing the sort of collection of domains we're allowed. So we're sort of increasing, imagine it in the sort of house measure, we're making this ball bigger and bigger and bigger. However, now we can't let the domains run away too quickly. So actually we kind of like a bungee, we come back to the ball asymptotically. So this is actually quite fun in some ways, at least to me. So any sequence minimizer then must house or converge to the ball of unit perimeter as k goes to infinity. So actually you have these minimizers under perimeter constraint, as long as you can give some control on the diameter, it doesn't. It certainly doesn't have to be sort of a uniform control by a constant, but sort of a uniform control by some growing function, then you can find minimizers and actually recover this case of perimeter. Now, so, um, so sort of to end, or maybe we'll just remark on a few things. So other things I've been interested in, you have these things where you have Neumann and Dirichlet. So in general, Neumann, you know, you have existence minimized under diameter constraint, but not perimeter constraint, and in Dirichlet, under perimeter and diameter constraint. Now, if you mix Neumann and Dirichlet boundary conditions, you get so-called Zeremba eigenvalues, kind of which arrangements then, um, can you have that you do get more Dirichlet-like behavior, by that I mean existence uh, of minimized under perimeter constraint, or more like Neumann behavior. So I won't say so much there, but the sort of general philosophy is that if you can kind of force the geometric arrangement, so you always end up crushing Neumann towards Dirichlet, then your life is good. So I think sort of with time, I'll finish there, and sort of thank you for listening, and a little smiley face. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the talk. Um, we have time for questions now, so if you have a question, perhaps just unmute yourself. There's one in the chat already, so uh, Chris Judge is asking, what about uh, Robin eigenvalues? Um, okay, so yeah, good question. So um, so I think actually there's a, I was actually just considering this only very recently, so maybe, so, so but with Robin, you have these continuity of convex domains. I think there was a paper um, by Simone Sito. Um, so basically you have the continuity in this case. So eventually minimizers will exist. I think if you exploit the Faber-Kran, then you can get minimizers to exist, uh, maybe somehow doing this. And then, uh, you should get the same asymptotic behavior. You'll get it going to the ball. So I don't know. I don't actually know specifically in which case. So under diameter constraint, they certainly have to go to the ball under perimeter constraint. I'll have to look. I don't know so much about Rob. This is not, it's something I've not looked at yet. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wants to ask something or comment on something? Perhaps a, a very naive question. Your your inequalities are written for the counting functions, right? So it, I guess you could write them for the eigenvalues then also, or it's not something relevant. Ah, uh, so it's not it's not too relevant here because we just really want to sort of strip out the leading term. So somehow yeah. we are. Uh, or I think maybe you could, but there's not so much use. But I'm trying to sort of work on ways of. It's nice because in a way you're not being sort of too greedy to begin with. You don't want the leading term to come. You kind of get it as an asymptotic. So it's if you have better control over the remainders, can you sort of shave it down well? But yeah, in this case, you are you only need it for the counting functions. It's for the eigenvalues that sort of comes asymptotically. Um, if there are no more questions, we will thank you again, Sam, for the, the talk. Thank you very much. And uh, we will resume uh, next week.